All right, well, thank you very much to Queen's University for the opportunity to take part in this event and this session. Uh, this conference has already touched on many of the issues that are alive at the OECD right now. And it's really a pleasure to be able to share with you some of the work that my directorate has been doing uh, around gender and the digital transformation. So looking to the future is always going to be an exercise in uncertainty and forecasting or predicting how a woman will fare in the digital transformation is really no different. So The Economist recently had a look in their crystal ball as part of their The World If Spread and they noted that in 2018 just 7% of government leaders, 15% of board members and 3% of chief executives are female. And they told a tale whereby through various actions and measures Women reached parity globally as CEOs and took over Davos in 2069. Now, with any story, there's always a bit of reality lurking under the surface. And I think with The Economist story, there are several elements that are relevant to today's discussion. One is the question of skills, of course, including STEM skills, so science, technology, engineering, and maths. Another is around the technological breakthroughs that are leading to new ways of working. And yet another is the role of artificial intelligence and automation. And so what I would like to do uh, today is to highlight some of the evidence and uh, the policy directions we've been working on at the OECD. And in particular, I'm going to draw on our uh, Going Digital project, uh, which is related to digital transformation. It's taking what we call deep dives into a number of issues, including jobs and skills. And I'm going to combine that with the work that we've been doing this year for the G20 on uh, bridging the digital gender divide, because I think that together these analyses offer a number of important observations and policy directions and perhaps some open questions for our discussion. So I think it's worth just taking a moment to recall how big this transformation actually is and how pervasive it's going to be. So we've all got a smartphone. It's really just the beginning of a new era where everything is connected, it's generating torrents of data, it's opening up new opportunities for data-driven innovation across every sector. And work-wise, we can see that the digital transformation is driving new business models. You've got digital products being developed without much fixed capital investment, uh, scaling across borders without much mass, including employees, and without leaving much of a geographic footprint. At the same time, you've got digital technologies enabling entrepreneurship at the micro scale. You've got people accessing market intelligence and global networks right from the start. And it's not just a rich world phenomenon either. So half the world's now connected to the internet, up from 4% 20 years ago. And no general purpose technologies, not electricity, the internal combustion engine, not even water, has diffused this fast. So let's start by taking a, a look at some of the evidence on new ways of working. So we talked a bit yesterday about platform jobs. Platform-based jobs can create new options for women to participate in labour markets, both local and global. In some developing countries, in fact, it may even enable women to exit the, uh, the shadow economy. And one aspect of platform work that is it can make it possible to have a more flexible work schedule, and it allows women to support their families and work at the same time. And uh, what this chart shows you is evidence that the highest share of women working from home, uh, countries that have the highest share, also have the highest maternal employment rates, and you don't get that kind of relationship uh, for, for men. Interestingly, 86% uh, of sellers on Etsy, so that's a home decoration platform, are women. 67% of the hosts on Airbnb are women. And in the US, the proportion of taxi drivers well, the proportion of female drivers is higher for Uber at 14% than it is for traditional taxis at about 8%. And a number of studies have suggested that for women, it's this flexible working hours that are a key perceived benefit of platforms alongside the supplementing of income. Digital technologies can also offer new opportunities and new paths to women's entrepreneurship. So the OECD has been working with Facebook and the World Bank to run a monthly survey on the future of business. And it takes a look at the perceptions and the challenges and the outlook of small and medium-sized enterprises who have an active Facebook page. And at the moment, it covers about 42 countries. Results from the April survey this year suggest that about 29% of SMEs were managed by a mainly female team. A further 24% had a, a mixed management team. 
But interestingly, earlier surveys found that women-run firms exceeded the share run by men in Australia, in Canada, the Philippines, the UK, and the US. And in contrast to the offline world, female entrepreneurs on Facebook actually had, on average, similar business confidence scores to men. And in some countries, such as Malaysia and the Philippines, actually, the, the women were significantly more optimistic. Now, digitalization is creating job opportunities in new industries and new occupations, but of course, as we discussed yesterday, it's also leading to job losses as more tasks traditionally performed by people are either automated or offshored or, or both. Now, we've typically related the risk of automation uh, to the manufacturing industry and therefore primarily male jobs. But our analysis at the OECD shows a slightly more mixed picture. So there are some large industries with very high shares of women that are at a high, share, uh, a high risk of, of automation. So if you think about the food and beverage service activities and retail trade. Men in turn are dominating industries like manufacturing and construction, transportation, where the average risk of automation is also high. You then have other female dominated sectors like education, social work and healthcare. They have a lower risk of job automation, but because many women actually work in those sectors, the absolute number of female workers at risk of being displaced is still high. And when you sum across all these industries, what you find is that the average risk of automation seems to be similar for men and women. <coughs> so will this observation hold in the future? It's important to note that the risk of automation, of course, is not the same as actual job losses. And adoption of new technologies can be quite slow due to various hurdles related to legal, ethical, uh, safety, social or economic reasons. And history also tells us in the past that we've adapted to major technological challenges. And innovations trigger new production, new consumption, new investment, which is leading to new jobs. And what that suggests is that the way that digital technologies diffuse across sectors is actually going to be a critical uh, factor in the way our labour markets change. And what we know is that the diffusion of tech tech digital technologies across uh, countries, industry, firms is actually quite uneven at the moment. And what we've done at the OECD is to measure some of the key components of the digital transformation and how they've diffused over the last 15 years. And we've used indicators of investment and uptake of ICT hardware, uh, like computers, uh, software, stock of robots, uh, intermediate ICT goods like chips and sensors, intermediate ICT services like the cloud, ICT specialists, oh, there we go, uh, and the intensity of e-sales. And what you find is that the speed at which these different components of the digital transformation are penetrating manufacturing in the top panel and services in, in the bottom really differs depending on the technology that you're talking about. And it's a far from homogenous transformation, which really adds to the uncertainty about the future. How many oopsies. Might pick one. Okay. So I think an important aspect then about the future of work for women is the degree to which women are actually involved in shaping the digital transformation. And we've done some work uh, looking at data on innovative startups looking for venture capital investments. And what we've found is that only 11% of such startups um, have female founders. Now, the share varies substantially across countries and sectors, but even at best, you find that female entrepreneurs represent less than a third of all startup founders. And this chart shows you the situation in G20 countries. Uh, I think Canada's at about 10%. When we dig into this data a little bit more, we also find a gender gap in funding and acquisition. So, in a sample of about 25,000 startups operating across a wide set of countries and sectors, uh, female-led business ventures, so startups with at least one female founder, are significantly less likely to be funded. Even if they are funded, they receive on average about 23% less funding than male-led startups. Even after you control for the location and the nature of the startup and also for the educational level and professional background of the founders. And female-led startups are also 30% less likely to have a positive exit, so to be acquired or to have an initial public offering. Another way that you can look at this issue is to see how women are uh, actually contributing to innovative outputs. 
and we've done some work on this using patents as a proxy. So over time, there's been an increasing participation of women in inventive activities, as measured by the number of patents featuring at least one woman in the team of inventors. It, it differs according to technology areas, but nevertheless, this chart shows you that the share of patents with women inventors remains below 15% in many countries and is typically lower for ICT patents uh, than for those in other technologies. Now, given that ICT technologies are a key uh, ingredient in the digital era, uh, this is something of a concern. We've also developed some experimental <coughs> indicators looking at the involvement of women in the software field. So we looked at information on R, which is a popular open source programming language for data analysis, and we found that about three quarters of the 12,000 R-based software packages uh, developed during a five-year period, 2012 to 2017, were produced by teams composed only of men. And what this chart shows you is the peripheral position of women in the co-authorship network emerging amongst the top 1,000 most downloaded R package authors. So each of these points represents uh, an author, and the thickness of the links mirrors the number of packages that they're co-authoring uh, between each of those pairs. And the network clearly shows that the female authors, who are in orange, are relatively few, and they're also less connected than their male counterparts. And this analysis is consistent with some work that the International Telecommunications Union has done, looking at online communities for developers. For example, they found that of GitHub's 5,500 surveyed users, only 2% were female. One sort of brighter spot there, there is slow progress in the extent to which men and women are collaborating in inventive activities. So in the uh, five-year period 2010 to 2015, 17% of patent families were produced by mixed teams inventors, and that was up three percentage points from the earlier period. But actually, when you calculate uh, at this pace, women's participation in patenting activities, either in the form of women-only teams or as part of mixed teams of inventors, would reach about 49% only in 2080, which is not great. So turning to the world of work more broadly, we know that to participate fully in the digital era, skills are really vital. And we know also that skills provide an important safeguard against the risk of automation. So fewer than 5% of workers with a tertiary degree are at high risk of losing their job due to automation on average, compared to about 40% of workers with a lower secondary degree. And that's good news for women, because across OECD countries, more women than men are now tertiary graduates. But do women have the right skills to navigate the digital economy? Gaps start to emerge when you look at specific subjects. And here you see that in a number of G20 countries, the share of women graduating in ICT studies is actually quite low. So it's less than a third in Canada for the tertiary and, and doctorate holders, for instance. Now, of course, um, surviving in the digital era doesn't mean we all have to be ICT geeks, thank goodness. And so building on the work that we've done on the digital diffusion across industries that I showed you earlier, we've taken a look at what skills seem to be demanded in digital and less digital intensive industries based on data from the OECD survey of adult competencies, or PIAC. And so what we've found is that for two types of skills, labour market returns are significantly higher in digital intensive industries than in less digital intensive industries. And they are advanced numeracy skills, and self-organisation skills. And when you also include self-employed workers uh, in this, you find that management and, and communication skills also command a higher premium in digital intensive industries. And the fact that these skills are commanding a premium in salaries and bonuses, suggesting that they're more valued in these digital intensive sectors. What this chart suggests, though, is that men are generally better endowed with the skills that command an extra wage premium in digital intensive industries, as shown by the green bars. So men are generally endowed with higher uh, numeracy and advanced numeracy skills, as well as with higher task-based skills related to self-organisation and management and communication. And that result is concerning because as the digital transformation unfolds, it progressively affects all industries, including those that are currently less digital intensive. The fact that women are less endowed with the skills that are especially required 
could end up widening gender pay gaps and reduce the ability of women to successfully uh, pursue careers in those industries. I would note, however, though, that women are generally better endowed with literacy skills and with ICT accounting and selling skills uh, than men. So it's not a completely bleak picture, especially when you consider that uh, on the previous chart, we saw that ICT skills are generally commanding the highest wage premium uh, compared to other types of skills. Uh, but we also refine that the returns to advanced numeracy and management and communication skills are actually significantly higher for men than for women in digital intensive industries. Why is this? Well, maybe one explanation is that women are discriminated against with respect to their expected performance in these types of tasks. Maybe male networks are stronger in digital intensive industries, leading to better wage bargaining outcomes. Um, we also can't rule out perhaps productivity effects that might explain different returns to these task-based skills between men and women. But at the same time there, you can also see that women seem to receive an additional wage premium on their ICT skills. And maybe that's explained by them being more productive than men when performing the same sort of amount of these ICT related tasks, and maybe that's due to their higher literacy skills. So just in the few minutes that remain, I'd like to turn to thinking about policy implications. And to frame this, I'd like to propose that we keep in the back of our minds that the digital transformation is making it really hard for policymakers to stay in their comfortable policy silos. Uh, many of the issues we're now dealing with are cutting across policy portfolios, and there are new trade-offs that we're finding between different policy objectives. And so in our Going Digital uh, project, we are developing an integrated policy framework to try and help governments establish a more coherent and strategic approach to digital transformation. And we're using this wheel as a way to think through the policy issues. What it proposes is that there's seven important building blocks that bring together policy domains in an integrated way to support the development of a digital transformation strategy. And I think actually that this can provide a very useful structure for thinking about the policy approaches needed to ensure a positive future of work for women. So I'm going to propose some ideas around four of these building blocks, starting with uh, use and access. So based on the evidence that I showed you about skills in digital intensive industries, perhaps some possible fruitful actions would be to further promote female participation in STEM studies, but particularly to improve those uh, advanced numeracy skills. At the same time, I think updating, upgrading the skills and competencies of those in the labour market is also urgent, and helping women to actually participate in adult learning or other on-the-job training is going to be essential. As we saw from the returns to skill analysis, there needs to be equal emphasis given to some of these other digital skills, such as self-organisation, management and communication, which are all highly valued in digital intensive sectors. Now, as well as that, the job effects of digitalisation also depend on access. So women can't engage in platform work, for instance, if they don't have access to high-speed, uh, affordable broadband. And so tackling affordability barriers and ensuring that the overall environment for telecommunications investment is competitive is actually another key building block for a successful future of work for women. As we saw, I think there's definitely scope for women to play a much greater role in shaping the future digital transformation by getting in at the ground level and being involved in innovative activities and entrepreneurship. So promoting, investment, uh, promoting diversity sorry, in research teams, looking perhaps to shape public policy on financing to support gender balance, and fostering networking as some potential uh, policy avenues to take. There's also clearly a need to continue fighting negative biases and stereotypes. So for example, at 15 years of age, on average across OECD countries, only half a percent of girls wish to become ICT professionals. Uh, compared to 5% of boys, and twice as many boys as girls expect to become engineers, scientists, or architects. So changing some of these gender-specific expectations about professions is really key. And I think an important part of that, and something that the OECD prides itself on doing, is doing a better job of collecting data. So in this case, gender disaggregated data will really help us monitor and assess the policy actions that we take in this area. So overall, you know, I think that the future of work for women can be a bright one, but policy does have an important role to play here if we're going to close the uh, digital gender divide. 
So thank you very much.